Good morning and welcome to Focus on the Bible. I am so glad that you are listening. I want to begin by inviting you to our services at Eastside. Be at nine o'clock for worship, followed by Bible classes for all ages at 9.30 and then at 10.30 for a second period of worship. In addition, we meet at six on Wednesday evenings for Bible study. We'd love to have you come and visit with us soon. Last week, we began a lesson by my brother, Adam Andrews, on roadblocks. And now, the conclusion of that lesson. It was worth it to heal one per- person. Sometimes we might look at something and we might go, you know, I, it's just not really worth our effort, right? We, we're, we're not going to get much out of maybe the effort that we're going to put into this. And it's just, it just doesn't add up. It, it was worth it for Jesus to go across the sea for just one man. And, and I want us to make the point that if, if Jesus was going to die on the cross just for one person, if it was just for you and the rest of mankind, the rest of society, the rest of the world was going to reject him, he would have still have died on that cross. It was worth it to him. And I think sometimes we forget that. But Jesus steps off this boat, and there who's waiting for him? An unlikely person a ruler of the synagogue by the name of Jairus, and and he not only just welcomes Jesus to his home, he falls down at his feet. And what would cause this man and the position that he is in to, to do this to Jesus, it would have to be something significant, and we know that it is. His only daughter, 12 years of age, is Dying. Matter of fact, one of the translations says that, that he says that my, my daughter is, has died, right? He, he basically assumes that it is moments away from happening. But he, he's asking for Jesus to come, asking for help. And in the midst of this, as, as you can imagine, the conversation is going on and, and, and all the people who might have questions and the disciples who are there, and as they're maybe making their way to Jairus' house, verse 43 kind of interrupts this scene of Jairus' 12-year-old daughter and what's going on with her, that there was a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all of her livelihood on phys- physicians and, and could not be healed by any of them. It didn't say that she had just tried some things. It said she had tried everything. She had exhausted all of her resources to try to be healed. I want you to think back, too, about Jarius and and, and his position here. Why didn't he just call for the doctors? Perhaps that he did, or perhaps that he knew it would do no good, as bad as she was. Nonetheless, this woman as Jesus is passing through, touches the hem of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped, and Jesus Jesus is aware of it. He asks, who touched me? And, of course, Peter just kind of almost mockingly says, like, who touched you? Who, who hasn't touched you, right? Everybody's around you. And Jesus is conscious of the fact that, that power has gone out of him in verse 46. And, and so I think what's interesting about that is as you look at this Even some of the other translations uh, emphasize the importance of this, that that the woman thought if she could just just touch his garment, she would be healed. Her great faith is a testimony, certainly to to many others, and yet Jesus would note at that and say that, Daughter, be of good cheer, your faith has made you well, in verse 48. And this amazing scene unfolds as Jesus here heals this woman, is is conscious of the fact that that he has healed this woman, and and he's having a discourse with them that, well, here comes the messenger. I want you to picture this in your mind of what it would look like. How do you think Jairus felt when he saw the messenger coming? They're making their way to the house. But how do you think he felt when he saw the messenger coming? I feel pretty confident in my own mind that Jarius knew all too well what this meant. This was not good news. As a matter of fact, I, I believe his fears were probably uh, confirmed when the messenger comes and says, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. Jesus hears it. And he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe and she will be made well. I think there's an important statement made in verse 50 that we miss where he says he answered him because I think Jarius at this point believes it's too late. It's too late. 
And Jesus responds to that. Even if he didn't physically utter it, he probably at least uttered it in his heart, and he says, only believe. It's going to be okay. And so they go to the house, and he brings with him, verse 51, Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother. Five, five witnesses are going to be enough to what is going to happen. And I find it interesting that the other gospel accounts also mention what happens is that as all the people are outside and they're weeping and mourning, and, and it's always tragic when someone dies, but it's especially tragic when a child dies, right? And as they're weeping and mourning, Jesus says, don't cry because she's not dead, she's just sleeping. And they make fun of Jesus. They ridicule Jesus. Nonetheless, Jesus continues. He puts everybody outside the house in verse 54, and he looks at the little girl and he says, little girl, arise. And immediately her spirit returns and she rose. And he said, give her something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. <laughs> They're about to find out on their own. Can you imagine the sound of that place when she walks out, when she walks out. I think it's interesting to note that there are several roadblocks that come up really in both of these cases in verses 40 through 56. For Jarius, I think his position could be a problem, right? But desperate times call for desperate measures. He's got to go to Jesus. His daughter is close to death, and, and, and I would suggest to you that there's no hope in modern medicine because if there had been, then he wouldn't have been waiting for Jesus. He would have just called for the doctors. So either they had tried that or there was just no hope. But either way, Jesus was the only chance that he had for his daughter. And the same is true here for this woman who, interestingly enough, has this same illness for as long as this little girl's been alive, 12 years. And, and she not only has this illness, but, but how it would affect her in society. Leviticus chapter 15 would describe her as being perpetually unclean. As a matter of fact, even touching Jesus makes Jesus unclean, except for the fact that he is the Son of God. The risk that she takes, the ridicule that she should receive as a result of doing this, how would the other religious teachers uh, teach her, and how would they respond to her for doing what she has done, for touching Jesus would mean that he would be unclean, and that he would need to fast, and he would need to become clean later in the day, but not needed for Jesus. She has exhausted every hope that she has, and like Jarius, desperate times call for desperate measures. And where else is she going to go? I want to conclude our lesson by making a, a very, I think, important point here, and it really is the point of, of these stories combined. Yes, Jesus does amazing things here, right? He speaks and the storm is calmed. He speaks and the demon-possessed man is, is healed and has his senses and the people come out and they see him sitting and eating and, 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 and everything is fine and, and, and he's not acting like he's been acting for, for some time. And the same could be true of Jairus' daughter and the same would be true of the woman who had the flow of blood, although that might be a little more private. But nonetheless, Jesus performed great and unbelievable miracles here showing his power over the natural and the spiritual and the physical and the Hadean world. But here's the point. Jesus never used his power to avoid the trials in this chapter. You know, Jesus lays down in the boat. He's been teaching all day. He's exhausted. He needs a good nap. He certainly knows that a storm is coming. What he could have done is gone... You know, just brush the storm away because he needs a good nap. He doesn't need his disciples to wake him up. Just make the storm go away. But he didn't do that. And, and knowing as he's going across the, the sea and maybe for a, a moment or two of rest, he's going to encounter this demon-possessed man. He could have sent him away before he ever got there. He could have healed the man of the demons before he ever got there and never interacted with the man. He could have done that. He could have stopped the flow of blood in the woman or he could have, he could have prevented the, the daughter of Jairus from dying before he ever stepped off the boat. And this then is the point. Following Jesus does not mean that he will use his power 
to keep us from the storms of life. I don't like that idea, if I'm being honest. But it certainly is scriptural. Following Jesus does not mean he will use his power to stop some difficulty from coming. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in verses 3 through 5, I'm sorry, it's a little smaller font, maybe it might be more difficult to read. But Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. He doesn't save us from the trial. He saves us through the trial and the difficulty. As I said, it's probably the most depressing sermon uh, and the entire series that we're going to have this year. Because when I think about roadblocks and difficulties, and I think about my own personal prayers to God, so much of my prayers is, God, don't let this happen! And not that that's wrong to pray for. I think that's very appropriate to pray for. But the point is, is that if God chooses to answer no to that in our prayers, no, you're, you're going to have to face that storm. You're going to have to face that roadblock. It doesn't mean that He doesn't love us. He loves us just as much as He loved Jairus' daughter and this woman and the man who had had demon possession by the legion and His disciples who were afraid for their lives. He loves us just as much as He loves them. But just like them, we need to learn the lesson of who we're with and the power that He has and our need for reliance on Him. What is it like when parents do not allow their children to face difficulties, struggles, and trials? How does that child end up? We generally describe them as a brat, is generally how we describe them, right? Why? Because they always get what they want, and they don't have challenges, and, and they don't really know what is real struggles and problems. And so when small things come up in their life, they just lose their mind. And we go, that ain't nothing. And I think our loving Father does the same for us. He allows us to go through these trials and difficulties so we can remember what really matters and who really matters and what power it is that He has. And that it's not of ourselves. It's not in us. It's not what we've done. But our reliance is always and completely on Him regardless of what roadblock we face, regardless of what times we ask why our trust and confidence is on Him. That's why we face the roadblocks. Get your psalm book out into the numbers selected. I appreciate your attention this morning. Again, I know this is not the most encouraging lesson (laughs) to be reminded that we will continue to face roadblocks. Not wrong to pray against them. But when we do face them, and we know that we will, may we respond as we should. May we be like Jarius and we go seeking the Lord, knowing He can be found. If we can help you do that, if spiritually maybe the roadblock is you haven't obeyed the gospel, then remedy that by going to the one who died for your sins, believing and repenting and confessing and being immersed in the water for mission of sins. Or maybe you've done that, but maybe the roadblock in your life is because of your own actions, your own spiritual setbacks. It's your fault. And he too is a loving Father who seeks to forgive us of our sins if we will humbly come back to Him. If we can help you and encourage you anyway, please come now as together we stand and as we sing. Thank you so much. Have a great and wonderful day.